<laughs> and years of training. Too. Yeah. <laughs> Army motto. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right, we're good to go. Well, thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to um, our Public Health and Human Services Board on Tuesday, April 19th at 8.35 a.m. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Um, first thing is the approval of the consent agenda, uh, including our, our, our meeting agenda and the minutes from last meeting. Um, any, any other items uh, anyone would like to pull from the consent agenda, discuss further? If not, I'd entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Mr. Chair, I will make that motion. Thank you, Commissioner <coughs> Swalson. We have a motion. Is there support? Support. Thank you, Commissioner Hawkins. We have a motion and support. Any further discussion? Hearing or seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Um, Funny, funny story though is there are a couple adjustments to the agenda that <laughs> that I should have mentioned. Uh, two typos, small that's ones. Funny, that's funny, huh? That's funny in an <laughs> uh, awkward way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, two two typos in our in our procl in our um, proclamations there, um, and we can go over those when we get there. But also, we wanted to introduce um, Stacy Schmidt, um, which we'll do. I'd, I'd suggest. Um, just uh, after the proclamation, so um, my apologies for that oversight. Um, but that moves us on to item three, um, the Public Health Week and County Health Day proclamation. And uh, the first item, 3A, is, is to request that this board acknowledges the proclamation made by Governor Walls, uh, recognizing this week, uh, uh, or April, the week of April 4th as, as Public Health Week, in Minnesota and thank the public health team at Cook County for their contributions and um, I'll take a moment just to, to read the proclamation out loud if I may. Coming from Governor Walls, whereas the public health community protects and improves the health of all people working to make all communities great places to live, work and play and whereas public health plays a crucial role in promoting good health and greater longevity for Minnesotans by working to immunize people against the disease, identifying and controlling environmental health hazards and infectious diseases, improving the health of mothers and children, and promoting healthy behaviors such as increased physical activity, good nutrition, and smoking cessation. And whereas Minnesota's public health professionals are on the leading edge of developing new strategies to detect and control disease outbreaks, address emerging environmental contaminants, communicate valuable information about health care costs and quality, prepare for large scale emergencies and promote healthy communities. And whereas the public health community fights against health inequities shaped by social, economic, environmental and political conditions and institutional racism because improving the health of those experiencing inequality, inequity, including people of color, American Indians, rural Minnesotans, immigrants and refugees, LGBTQ plus people and people with disabilities leading to improved health for all. And whereas public health regulation is a critical tool for building and sustaining safe and healthy communities for Minnesota and beyond. And whereas state, local and tribal public health workers have been at the forefront of the pandemic response, working tirelessly to keep communities safe from COVID-19 through vaccination, testing, contact tracing, and other efforts, and sharing information to help people make decisions for themselves and their families. Now, therefore, Tim Walls, Governor of Minnesota, do hereby proclaim April 4th through 11th, 2022, as Public Health Week. So that is the, um, the first item under three, that 3A, and... Um, I guess I'd entertain a motion for, for that acknowledgement. So Rana, thank you. We have a motion. Is there support? I'll support. Thank you, Commissioner Swalson. <coughs> Any further discussion? Just want to thank our public health workers, again, those who are here and those that are, that are not, uh, <laughs> for, for the work now and, and previously and into the future. Um, everything in that proclamation, I think, rings so true, and it's so important for, for our communities and and uh, yeah, can't thank you enough. So, um, 
And if Please. I may, Commissioner Mills, just bring your attention to the fact that we have one of our public health teams join <laughs> members joining us virtually this morning. I connected her via Teams mm -hmm. so that she could hear the proclamation she's up at the school actually conducting testing this morning. <laughs> And Grace isn't able to join us unexpectedly. And then Andrea Orist is here with us today as well. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you for, for the virtual connection as well. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. And then that brings us to item 3B. Um, through NACO, uh, um, April 19th is, is recognized as pub, um, County Health Day by the um, by NACO. And so just another recognition um, asking uh, ask from the Public Health Board. Um, and um, we have a representative from NACO here, um, Commissioner Storley, and, uh, and she's uh, particularly in the public health side of things at NACO. So really appreciate your work there and, and bringing issues bringing issues to us that you hear through through that avenue and um, more Reese's resources we can have um, I think the better so thank you there very important to represent Cook County in Minnesota too um, um, and so uh, I'll just read that item <coughs> April 19th is also recognized as County Health Day by the National Association of Counties requesting that the PHHS board thank and recognize the public health staff at Cook County for their efforts to drive improvements to community health and well-being, especially given the heightened focus on the public health due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, I don't know if we need a motion for that, but I um, want to point it out that there is uh, widespread support for, for the efforts that have been happening, um, I think recognized nationally as well as in our state and um, recognition we gave last month um, for the work that's done too. So um, thank you very much and um, don't want to be too awkward, but again, I, I feel like a round of applause is appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> And then that brings us on to the addition that I, I failed to mention in the uh, passing of the agenda, and that's the introduction of Stacy Schmidt. And I'll pass it over to Allison. Yes, yeah, so I'm uh, really excited to have Stacy Schmidt on our team. Stacy joined us in October, October of last year, and schedule wise, it just hasn't worked for us, for her to be able to join us for a formal introduction to the PHHS board. But Stacy moved into the position that was vacated by Cooper Turnus when he moved into his children's mental health and skills worker role. So Stacy comes to us from Bayfield County, Wisconsin, where she has a great deal of experience working with families and children. She's a great addition to our team, and we're really glad to have her on board. Anything, Stacy or Grace, that you'd like to add? Anything that you'd like to add or say? Um, did you want to say a few words? No, if you said it, so I did that. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Stacy comes with a lot of experience, and we're spreading it for experience. Stacy's a licensed social worker, and she has worked at Bayfield County, so she understands small communities. She's had great experience working with tribal communities, which is a real strength to our team, and we're so glad she's here. So. Okay. Monday will be. Six months already. <coughs> wow. Yep. Gone fast. <coughs> That's good. To, good to meet you in person. And um, we did have the the CJI um, timeline training together, but we, there wasn't a whole lot of interaction no. there. So yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for joining the team and, and being here for six months already. <laughs> And then that brings us on to um, item four, the, the COVID-19 situational update. And, and um, Grace is not able to be here, but Allison does have a, a written report to share. Well, I'll do my best to put on yep, Grace your Grace hat. hat. I don't know about <laughs> that. Though. All right, so uh, for a situational update, the case count is currently at 850 cases. It was at 824 on March 15th at the last PHHS board meeting. So we're up 26 cases in the last month. Uh, in the past seven days, we've only seen seven cases. While cases are nowhere near as high as we saw them during the Omicron surge earlier in 2022, we are still considered to have a low amount of COVID circulating in the community. 
cases have arisen significantly in the past week and a half. We have had four reported deaths in the county due to COVID-19, however, no new deaths reported in the last month. Um, in terms of our vaccination efforts, the vaccination rate in Cook County, and this data includes Grand Portage, is at 82.2% of those having completed the vaccine series, and 86.3 with at least one dose. Only 61.3% are up to date on their vaccination. So that's that gap in boosters. Um, in the past month, oops, sorry, I lost my spot. At this point, we have paused the effort to increase first boosters community-wide and instead are focusing on providing second boosters to those who are eligible. So in the last month, both the FDA and CDC made second boosters available to those 50 and older, as well as those with compromised immune system conditions. Uh, this recommendation was based off of data from Israel that showed that the second booster further reduces the rate of severe disease and death due to COVID-19 for this segment of the population. There are around 2,000 people in Cook County who are newly eligible for that booster. Uh, PHHS, along with Sawtooth Mountain Clinic, are working together to meet the demand for second boosters with events at the community center throughout May. Um, in other news on the COVID-19 front, we are continuing to wait on vaccination news for the under five group. Uh, the staff are beginning to look at recovery related topics, but still pulled pretty fully into response mode with both the increased cases and the large section of the population that's newly eligible for booster vaccination. Uh, Grace is continuing to serve on MDH's COVID-19 response and recovery work group as a representative from the Northeast region. And the goal of this group is to help create a regional and statewide strategy that can scale up or down in response to both viral activity and a hospital burden due to the disease. Any questions on Grace's report? I'll do my best and I have Andrea <coughs> here to back me up as well. And can certainly follow up if there's anything that I can address. Yeah, any questions from anyone? I have a question. I'm just wondering how the um, work is coming along at the community center with those second boosters. Are all of the clinics filled that are planned up until I think May 5th was they were scheduling them? Yeah, I don't know with certainty if all of the events this month are filled. I do know they have been filling up, and we have had to add more dates okay. and availability to be responsive to the demand and interest locally. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So significant, significant demand and interest. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's great. Cool. Commissioner Storley. Thank you. Thank you, Allison, for reporting for Grace. I just have a comment. Mm -hmm. I turned on the news this morning at 6 a.m. and found out that a federal judge has compromise CDC guidelines for mask wearing. They're now optional, I guess. So airlines do not require it. Oh. Some subway, some, uh, it depends on the city. So like Washington DC, New York City would have their own guidelines. But the bottom uh, result of this is the federal judge can now say to CDC, we're gonna either support you or not, and right now they're not supporting them. Mm. So what happens in the future when we have, again, maybe something pretty severe happening in our country, what does that say to the CDC as far as their governing, uh, you know, information and all that type of thing? Very disturbing. Yeah, it's very, very tricky. So you never know when you wake up in the morning what's gonna happen <laughs> in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Moral of the story there, huh? <laughs> it really is, but it was very, very discouraging to hear that. Yeah. <clears throat> I think people who are compromised will certainly still wear their masks, mm -hmm. but it's like, you know, there was a, a point of somebody sitting on a bus with a child going to chemo, they're wearing their mask, but nobody else around them are. Right. You know, it just puts a lot of compromised people. And maybe people don't even know they're compromised. Right. You know, sure. so it's just, I don't know. I guess it's going to be up to us individually yeah. right now. Yeah. That's the whole point of the, of the story. Yeah. We're lucky in Cook County we've had such good guidelines, yeah. such good cooperation. I had my last booster last Thursday, and oh. um, 
I think now the rest of it's going to be in May or maybe, I don't know, next week, but I got the last one for the first go round. Mm. And so it's encouraging to see people come out and do the boosters and, you know, then you wonder, well, how many more boosters are we going to need because my card is full? <laughs> so, <laughs> where do we go from there? They'll figure it out. <laughs> well, it's interesting, too, just observing how other countries are handling and yeah. and just case counts and just different I cultures. Know. You know, there's know. some cultures where masking before the pandemic, mm -hmm. excuse mm -hmm. me, before the pandemic was was part of that culture. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just really interesting. Mm -hmm can be overwhelming too, so I really appreciate the work that um, the staff are, are doing to help communicate best, best practices, best guidelines for, for our culture and our community. And um, yeah, it's a bit of a dance there. Mm -hmm. I saw, did you have a question? Yes, I you. thought I saw movement <laughs> earlier. <saw> yeah. <laughs> yes, I did. I wanted to ask more about the testing at the school um, and how that's working and how are we finding cases and how many do we test in a week? Yeah, I, um, so Andrea, uh, Andrea had to disconnect. She's getting oh. ready to start testing here at okay. nine <laughs> this morning. <laughs> um, but we can bring an update back next okay. month with more information. I do know that we're catching asymptomatic cases. It's mm -hmm. primarily open to school families and staff, although I believe today's event was expanded to other child care and youth programs throughout the county. Um, but in terms of the number of folks that we're testing on a weekly basis and how many positives we're catching, I'll have to follow up with more information on okay. that. Yeah, I just thought that would be interesting because mm -hmm. I think it was kind of a big thing we did mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. and I'd just like to follow up on is it working or, mm -hmm. you know, how's it working? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, I also hearing in the news um, just about wastewater testing. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know what that takes or what's involved there. But if, if that can be done at community levels, that could be powerful. So I don't know if we can ask to investigate that a little bit. See if that's a possibility, if it's impractical or, or uh, irrelevant for, for the size. I really don't know a whole lot about it, but I am hearing more and more about it. So I think that could be valuable discussion point for next time. And I did pull up the hub site to look into what availability is for next month for the boosters. It looks like the morning of Thursday the 5th is full. However, there are um, slots available in the afternoon of the 5th. And then additional uh, date was added for Wednesday, May 11th. So availability both in the morning and the afternoon of the 11th. And that, of course, can be found on our COVID-19 hub site. Thank you. <coughs> Any other questions, comments, thoughts? Well, then I'll uh, suggest we move on to staff report. Um, we have Lori Erickson here this morning, and uh, we get our um, 2021 financial report. Good, Good morning. morning. Good morning. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Yes. I hope you all have a fresh cup of coffee. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, get it'll settled, do. Get settled in a little bit. <laughs> Well, 2021 started out a lot like uh, 2020 ended. Um, we were challenged with many obstacles, but also given opportunities. The way we provide service to our clients during the pandemic continue, continued to evolve from the year prior. Between continually updated guidance from health officials, the changing service delivery mandates we were given, our staff and our supervisors were challenged very often to develop new procedures on how to continue operations in a safe manner. The full year-end financial report is attached to today's agenda. It's available online. Um, this presentation is going to explain what all the charts and graphs and things that you see in the, in the, uh, in the report. <coughs> Thank you. No, I don't see the same thing you see, so oh. I want to make sure I'm on mm -hmm. the same one here. Okay. You'll find this information on page two of the financial report. <coughs> the revenue that was received in the year was 4% more than we budgeted. This increased revenue came from governmental aid and grants and from charges for services. We did receive unbudgeted funds from state and federal 
uh, COVID-19 public health grants. We also increased our collections from client health insurance programs. This additional revenue is a direct result of our staff providing documented targeted case management, waiver case management, and care coordination. Expenditures were 12% lower than what we budgeted. Social services recognized the largest reduction in budgeted expenses. This was due to reduced out-of-home placements, including mental health placements. Those are the most challenging costs to anticipate. In-home support costs were also down in 2021 as clients and the contracted providers were trying to maintain their distance to stay healthy. We also have a shortage of independent contractors to provide the in-home support services to the community. Two resignations remained unfilled at year end. Client related travel costs were down as well as staff training and travel. Um, we have an excess of revenue received over the expenditures paid and I'll explain more about this as we get near the end. Um, there we go. The funding for PHHS comes from these specific areas. Federal and state grants made up 36% um, of our revenue in 2021. Fees and recoveries, including reimbursements from health insurance plans and license fees made up another 9%. A very small portion came from non-governmental grants and donations, and the remaining 53% of our revenue came from county tax. All of the PHHS expenses will fall into three departments, public health, economic assistance, or social services. There is a fourth component to PHHS, and that's the administrative staff and the agency-wide costs. These expenses are allocated to each of the three departments based on their FTE. This is the PHHS org chart as of the end of 2021. At the top of our chart is the Human Services Board and Advisory Councils, followed by our County Administrator and our Department Head. We include contracted providers in our org chart because they provide many mandated services, such as professional nursing staff to provide maternal child health services, mental health clinical supervision, child support services, employment services, and dependency assessments. As I go through each department in the report, you'll hear more about the services that are provided by our PHHS staff. Since it's Administrative Professionals Day next week, I want to first acknowledge our behind the scenes administrative staff. This includes the director, one executive administrative assistant, an office support case aid, and then the fiscal team with me, the fiscal supervisor, one fiscal officer, and our accounting technician. These administrative professionals provide direction and leadership to the agency, collaboration with local, regional, and state partners, front office support, contracts management, outpatient treatment financing coordination, and community outreach. Our staff also provide the IT provide support to the IT department by updating the PHHS and the Cook County websites and provide technical support to our staff. Additionally, the fiscal team also provides budgeting, auditing, grant and financial management. Over 5,000 checks were written last year through accounts payable and our social security rep payee program. Over $393,000 in revenue was brought in as a direct result of our building and collection efforts. So, little shout out to my team. <laughs> yeah. Costs that benefits the entire agency are split proportionally among the economic assistance, social service, and public health departments. This includes administrative personnel cost, office supplies, phones, fees to the state of Minnesota for the merit system, the state IT support, and the annual audit, as well as funds transferred to the county general fund for the courthouse office rent, the county MIS costs, and labor. As I drill down into each of the three departments, you'll notice a line item in each one that's called administrative allocation, and that's what these expenses are.
Starting with the Economic Assistance Department, the 2021 costs were 5% more than budgeted and revenue received was 3% more than budgeted. The biggest variance can be seen in the area of client programs where we saw an increased cost, but then also an increase in offsetting revenue. Federal and state funding made up 56% of the revenue received for economic assistance. This includes federal administrative aid, which supports some of the payroll costs for staff to provide the eligibility services of state and federal programs, as well as reimbursements for county paid client assistance. Fees and recoveries made up 4% and the remainder of the funding came from county tax. The economic assistance staff consist of one supervisor, four eligibility specialists, and one case aide who provides administrative assistance to the team and coordinates healthcare access services to clients. This professional team adapts and responds to many changes in federal and state policy while providing excellent service to the community. Staff provide eligibility determination and reviews for many state and federal programs such as cash and food assistance, housing support, several health care programs, and child care assistance. They also provide process applications for emergency assistance, county-funded burial support. Child support services in Cook County are provided through a contract with Carleton County. Along with the ongoing caseloads that require mandatory client eligibility reviews or renewals, there were 230 new applications for assistance last year. This is up from the prior five-year annual average of 162. The largest increase came from people applying for food support assistance. There was a 26% increase in the client program costs. However, there was a 37% increase in that offsetting revenue. This comes from state reimbursable assistance that we provide to clients. You'll see that we provided $139,000 in assistance for cost effective medical insurances, and then we received state reimbursements of $138,000. We provided transportation, I'm sorry, provider transportation allows community volunteer drivers to assist elderly eligible clients with medical rides and the state reimbursed us 77% of those costs. Healthcare access provides support to eligible residents to pay for their own medical transportation or medical lodging with reimbursement from the county. The state then reimburses us 96% of those costs. At this time, each county is obligated to perform collection duties on behalf of Minnesota Department of Human Services programs. Recipients of medical assistance benefits reimburse the program after their passing through the estate recovery process. For our collection efforts, our agency is allowed to retain a portion of the funds that we recover, and the remainder is returned to the state for future recipients. Our agency also collects client overpayments for the CASH, SNAP, or GA programs. In 2021, we collected a total of $59,741 on behalf of the state. And for our collection efforts, we were allowed to retain $26,950. Child support services have been provided through a contract with Carleton County since 2013. Uh, uh, the 2021 statistics show they have 136 open cases. They provide services such as case intake and assessment, establishing paternity, locating absent parents, establishing and enforcing orders for child support or spousal support, and collecting on current orders as well as arrears. a little far. Any questions regarding economic assistance before I jump ahead? <clears throat> I, 
uh, Mr. <coughs> Chair, just one question. I, I see that child support open cases are trending down, and I'm just wondering if there's any indication why that's happening. I'm sure that our uh, child support supervisor at Carleton County would have a very well-informed explanation okay. for that. <laughs> and Sorry, Alice. Know, I, didn't, it's all right. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Um, I, I could t take some guesses at why that mm -hmm. is, um, but I think what might be better is to have him come to a future board meeting and <coughs> present on case low trends and information, and I can arrange that with him. Yeah. He has offered to do that. He submits an annual contract report with additional detail on uh, measures that were held to by the State Department of Human Services, number of open cases. Um, but as you all know, it's really valuable to have that in-person presentation, the opportunity to ask questions. So I can coordinate that yeah. the day. And I, I don't want to trouble him either. Um, I mean, I just was curious. He, he did um, <coughs> offer to, to come up and present. So I can and he's, him he's presented before, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really good, really good conversation. Mm -hmm. My assumption is it's a good thing. Is that a poor assumption? It depends on how you sure, look at it. Depends. It's a complicated okay. question. Okay. Not my but you can say that's the wrong assumption, too. No, it, okay. could be, <laughs> uh, it could mean that there are less families on assistance. Um, that's one of the ways that child support is pursued is through uh, cash assistance or sometimes foster care when there's an absent parent. Um, but Dan, again, would be able to offer yeah. much more informed and nuanced discussion around that. Yeah. <clears throat> and part of the reason I asked the question is I just thought maybe, you know, maybe the assistance that has been um, <clears throat> provided to families during the pandemic has maybe cut into that a little bit. Mm. But who knows, it could, it could work the other way too, mm -hmm. with, with disruption in, in mm -hmm. services and whatnot, so mm -hmm. just curious. Good question. Any other, any other questions? <coughs> Just a note on our contract expense with Carleton County that has remained steady since we first entered into a shared service agreement with them in 2013 or 2014. So uh, we haven't seen an increase annually in the contract, and I think, you know, for all purposes, that continues to be a good arrangement for Cook County families. No, thank you. <coughs> okay, thank you, Larry. Moving on to social services. The social services department costs were 21% under budget. Revenue received was 2% less than anticipated. A new staff position was not filled until late in 2021. That was the SUD coordinator. Some resignations were also not immediately replaced. This reduced the personnel costs, but our biggest variances were in the children and family services, including out-of-home placements. They spent 35% of their budget. Mental health services spent 46% of its budget. On the revenue side, staff performing targeted case management and care coordination services generated more than anticipated revenue. This is reflected under the personnel services area um, and is used to offset some of the payroll costs. Lower reimbursement revenue in other programming areas correspond to the lower expenses that were put out in those areas. <clears throat> Federal and state aid made up 27% of the funding for social services revenue. Fees and recoveries added another 13%. A small portion came from a non-governmental grant and the remainder came from county tax. There are 15 compassionate professionals on the social services teams. Two supervisors who also provide direct support and case management to two distinct units. 12 staff providing social work case management or care coordination in specific programming areas and one case aide who provides administrative services for both teams. On paper, it does look like a lot of staff. However, there is little overlap or redundancy in services. Rather, many of these staff wear multiple hats while they serve our community. These staff provide services in protection investigations, child welfare case management, mental health case management for both adult and children. They provide information and referrals for services we cannot provide and initiate local and regional collaboration of services to clients in need. 
They also provide treatment coordination services, intellectual and developmental disability services, early response and intervention services for children and parents, child care and foster care licensing, min choices assessments, and care coordination for wavered services, and coordinating the in-home support program. Mental health clinical supervision and substance use disorder outpatient assessment and treatment are provided by contracted providers. The number of staff hours in children and family services was down slightly from 2020. One of the children's social workers made a lateral move over to the mental health unit and the resulting vacancy was not immediately filled. Make sure you're seeing the right one. The number of children in out-of-home placements continues to remain low, but with a slight increase over the last two years. This includes children in foster homes, group homes, mental health regional, I'm sorry, mental health residential treatment or correctional facilities. <clears throat> I never know if it's moving. There we go. PHHS contracts with AEOA to provide employment and training services for recipients of MFIP or DWP benefits. That would be the Diversionary Work Program. In the last couple years, the number of clients who were required to participate in these services was reduced due to state waivers that were in place during the pandemic. <coughs> We also contract with Wilderness Outpatient Treatment Program to provide assessments and outpatient group or individual treatment services, while our staff provide the coordination with facilities for inpatient treatment and financing. In 2021, 38 Rule 25 assessments were conducted and treatment was coordinated 35 times. 11 people participated in outpatient treatment services. <clears throat> The Wilderness Outpatient Treatment Program contract is funded by 66% county tax, 16% federal and state aid, and 5% from client or insurance fees. This program also receives half of the liquor license fees that are collected by the county. <coughs> Hours worked in the mental health services unit was down significantly from 2020. Our community support provider um, staff person resigned early in the year and this position was not filled. The children's services social worker joined the mental health unit part way through the year. So that's a good explanation for why the, the number of staff hours in that area were down. The number of adult clients receiving mental health services has fluctuated in the last five years, while the number of children receiving services has steadily increased. In our county, intellectual and developmental disability services are provided by one staff person. The number of annual hours working directly with clients was reduced in 2020, mostly by the lack of travel to visit out-of-county clients. The number of clients receiving developmental disability or CADI services saw a small rise in 2021. CADI services are the Community Access for Disability Inclusion. Uh, this provides home and community-based services to children and adults um, who require the level of care provided in a nursing facility. This helps people live as independently as possible while remaining in the community rather than being in an institution. So the one staff person who's providing uh, CADI services and the developmental disability services did see a small rise in 21. As time goes on, some children on this caseload may change 
from a child to an adult. So you'll see the allocation change, but the total number remains constant in some years. When a client moves out of the county, the ability to transfer their case depends on the kind of services they're receiving. Many times clients residing outside of Cook County are still receiving services and coordination from our office. The adult and home and community-based services team saw two resignations in 2021 whose positions remained unfilled at year end. This led to a significant reduction in the annual staff hours for this team. <clears throat> Adult services social workers know that our aging community members sometimes just need a little help. The in-home support program coordinates local independent contractors to provide homemaking, chore, and transportation services so that people can remain in their homes as long as they would like. We have seen a steady growth in the number of people seeking these services. However, due to the lack of service providers, there is a waiting list for people to receive this type of support. And with that, any questions regarding social services? Mr. Hawkins. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Laurie. This is my favorite meeting. <laughs> I love digging into the numbers, and I've been keeping track of this stuff but since 2015. So, uh, and I apologize, it was Easter weekend, and I didn't get to really dig in this weekend <laughs> as much as I wanted to. But there's a couple things I want to ask you about as far as um, <coughs> fees collected. And if you um, go back to like the um, chemical dependency page, and we had budgeted 7,500 in assessment fees, but we actually only got $1,977. There's a, that happened on quite a few different ones. So I'm just curious why and what's going on. And Sure, there could be times when a person, we can kind of see by the trend of the number of people that are gonna be seeking services that we can anticipate, okay, we might be able to collect in these types of fees. However, if a person doesn't have insurance, if the person doesn't um, have funding on their own to um, be able to pay for the fees, we don't have anybody to bill then. And we now have the, um, it used to be called the consolidated, um, uh, consolidated Chemical Dependency Treatment Fund, CCDTF. <coughs> it's now the Behavioral Health Fund. And so now we have somebody who in the last two years has been dedicated to helping the clients apply for those services through the state to try to assist us with getting those. So those would be state funding things that you see come in. Okay, so that's what I was wondering, do we charge for chemical dependency to the client then? And if they, we get reimbursed by insurance if they have it, and if not, we don't receive anything. I just want to make Correct. sure I understand and it. Prior to um, late 2018, we didn't have anybody in, um, in our fiscal unit to be able to do the, all this billing. Okay. The fiscal officer position was created and I was hired in late 2017 and then became supervisor just shortly after that. So it was late 2018 before we had somebody in that position that could really dive into going into um, uh, billing all the different insurance companies that people present when they when they seek services okay well that's what I was just going back and trying to match up well what's the trend here because I love <coughs> trends and looking at percentages and I'm like okay well why is it up here and down here and back and so thank you for because that was just one of my things that popped out right away why why is that so thank you for You're knowing welcome. that answer <laughs> and that's a it's a similar it, it reminds me of conversations we have at AHA um, as far as um, crisis services are concerned and having insurance and then there's also uncompensated care. And so, um, uh, yeah, it's always nice if you can collect and then when it's uncompensated care that really has imp impacts on, on the budget. And, um, and so I've asked uh, questions like, well, how, how or why is there more or less uncompensated care and it's it's a really difficult thing to chase and never there's never really a good explanation aside from just lack of insurance um, but it's really but our insurance collections 
really went up also. I mean, that was almost double the collections of what we budgeted. So I was just trying to make sense of oh, yeah. why did that go way up and <clears throat> this one go way down? I didn't. I'm still trying to figure out how to match up my lines. But. I would add to a comment to our insurance collections that we would expect that to be a bit higher. It's something that we've been working on improving our, our billing efforts internally. There are some limitations with our electronic health record that we use for the Wilderness Outpatient Treatment Program that requires a lot of duplicate entry, something that we've been working with both our clinical and our support staff to improve processes around ensuring that we're entering information and able to bill timely for insurances received. So I would hope to see continual improvement in that mm -hmm. area as well to ensure yeah. we're drawing down all possible revenue. Yeah, the, um, the AHA um, situation is also similar. Like the compensated care has gone <coughs> up significantly and the uncompensated care has gone down. It's just like, well, why? What's going on? But I mean, clearly in, in this case, it's, you know, concerted efforts into into that billing process um, and AHA I didn't I didn't get that sense necessarily but again we didn't have a, a clear answer there but it's just interesting very interesting trends like you say um, trying to understand it and then we can better better budget and better prepare and any other questions Commissioner Sullivan. Mr. Chair, yes. Um, Lori I have a question about home and community based um, services. You indicated there are clients on a waiting list. How many people do we have on a waiting list? I do know last year it was over 30, and I believe mm -hmm. I believe now Martina told me the number, and I'm sorry, I forgot. We can get you that information. Okay. Thank you. It seems like such a such a good step in providing service where um, they need a little extra help. They don't quite need assisted living or, you know, that kind of, you know, it's just such a good inter intermediate um, option. It's, it's um, really difficult that we, we don't have enough providers. <coughs> but we did make some efforts with the, <coughs> the um, subsidy or just that increase in, in payment, but, um, do we find impacts with that? Is that I don't know. I know that we have onboarded a few new providers. Yeah. I don't know that we're tracking whether or not that was a factor in their sure. applying. But yep. I imagine any, every, everything helps with that type of work. It's a lot of moving parts. <laughs> any other questions? Thank you, Lori. Okay. And moving on to public health. In public health, the costs were right on target and revenue received was 35% more than anticipated. Public Health was originally budgeted to use almost $45,000 in reserves to fund the temporary public health educators in 21. Unexpected revenue from the COVID-19 response grants provided more than enough to fund the temporary staff and provide support for the regular employees as well. Additionally, we applied and received an unbudgeted competitive grant from the National Association of County and City Health Officials, which further reduced the county cost. Public health funding comes 43% from federal and state grants, 5% from non-governmental grants and donations, and the remaining from county tax. Our public health department consists of one supervisor and two public health educators. Two part-time temporary public health educator positions were also used last year. This team of professionals provides leadership, grant writing, contracts management, emergency preparedness, vaccine planning and implementation, case investigation and contact tracing, and liaison to the schools and businesses, as well as the coordination of many, many community volunteers. <coughs> Using contracts with the Sawtooth Mountain Clinic and North Shore Health, the Cook County provides several additional public health programs, such as home care sliding fee program, child and teen checkup, family home visiting, SHIP, and WIC. Not represented in this financial report is the Medical Response Fund. In 2020, the county EOC 
partnered with North Shore Healthcare, um, North Shore Healthcare Foundation to par partially match the donations that were received for the public health pandemic support. Checks were coming in from everywhere. I would get phone calls from people in other states saying, I've traveled to Grand Marais, how can I help? And they would donate to the foundation and the foundation matched up to $20,000. In 2021, the Emergency Management Department through the EOC paid out over $23,000 through the general fund for supplies and costs related to the many vaccine clinic events that were put on by our public health staff and volunteers. The North Shore Healthcare Foundation fully reimbursed the county general fund for every penny that was spent. So this is something that doesn't appear in our fund, but this did come out of the, the county general fund. <clears throat> The public health community grants are awarded to community agencies through a competitive annual grant making process. A subcommittee of the Public Health Advisory Committee makes funding recommendations each year which is presented to the Human Services Board. Grants are made in line with the goals set forth in the Community Health Improvement Plan. These represent areas of essential community services that would go unfulfilled without support through this grant making process. If it were not for the county support of these community agencies, it could very well fall to our agency to meet some of these unmet community needs. And I know that was real brief considering all the work that they do, but are there any questions regarding public health? I, I have a question. Uh, are we have we made progress at all on um, just our evaluation of the, the public health grant fund? And just it, you know, there was so much demand there, and and we were so lacking. I didn't know if we had kind of dove into that um, further yet, or continued conversations. And, and I am very grateful for the process because there's been huge improvements there um, over the years. That I have not been a part of, but um, yeah, any any thoughts there or insight? I'm happy to give a status update on where we're at for the 2023 budget cycle. Um, our Public Health and Human Services Advisory Council meets May 3rd, I believe, the first week in May, uh, and we'll be uh, reconvening the group at that point, our mm. subcommittee of that council, to review the year-end reports from 2021, which are due back now. I know that's okay. on Grace's radar to request those, as that's typically our first step in beginning the process for the next calendar year. Uh, we do hope to shift that timeline up a bit sooner this year in the overall county budget process so that we're, we are able to make a more informed recommendation uh, to the county board that's reflective of the, the needs that we're seeing from applications that come in from local nonprofits and service agencies. So I don't know that I can commit to a timeline yet, but we're yep. hoping to be able to bring the subcommittee together soon to review year-end reports, discuss any changes to next year's application process and opening that as soon as possible. It will be a full 30-day uh, application period. It will be well publicized through media releases on the website uh, and others. Um, <coughs> Thank you. Um, this is a little out there and um, maybe not the most appropriate place to, to spitball, but um, I, I, um, I like that process a lot. Uh, especially those improvements that have been made and, and just how important they are in our community. And considering the uh, um, severe need of child care, I was wondering if we could have a similar process for child care providers to help because it, 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 my take on it is that this is a national, child care is a national issue, a statewide issue. And so really I would hope that there would be efforts happening there to help provide, you know, subsidies because there is that, um, it, it's a broken market um, and and it's, it's, it's not a viable business basically. Um, and so it really requires a subsidy. Um, but um, my read is that there is not yet a federal or state effort happening here and yet we see this <coughs> real real stark need and so um, I would hope uh, that we as as a community could could do something and provide a similar process and subsidy for for our local providers 
um, to try to address address the shortcoming. Um, and and if it's well demonstrated um, as say a pilot project, and we can call it that even, um, just so that we aren't committing for a long time. Although it's been brought to my attention that once you start that, there's no going back. But my my thought was is if we can demonstrate that successfully, that maybe the state could recognize that and either follow suit or or feds and follow suit. Uh, don't expect federal attention really, but I do expect state attention. Um, so it's just something I wanted to 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 throw out there um, as an idea um, for consideration as you know you're developing the 2023 budget, um, and I don't know what formalities are needed if if we want to. Certainly, we want more discussion on that, um, but what formalities are needed if we want to approach approach the child care crisis in that way? Um, so that's kind of a kind of a big deal. I don't know if anyone has any knee-jerk reactions that they're comfortable sharing or, or any thoughts or experiences um, around that, um, that idea. And we can revisit it again some other time, but that is just an idea that I wanted to, to bring forward to, to roll around in our minds. Commissioner Mills, if I may, I can comment that our, our statutory authority to grant public health dollars through the public health fund process specifies that they be nonprofit. So that has been mm. a limiting factor in the past to some of our family home operated yeah. businesses. Yeah. However, we do have precedence during um, the pandemic of issuing CARES Act dollars to uh, mm. child care providers regardless of their uh, status as either nonprofit or, or family providers. Mm -hmm. That was a very specific pot of money in a very short timeline in which to get those funds out to folks as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> interesting, yes. But that limitation wouldn't preclude us from using levy dollars for something like that, correct? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, and that's, <coughs> I mean, I see the need and, and I kind of think whatever it takes, um, but again, it's a much larger conversation that we would need plenty of community input on. Um, but but I see I see radical steps needed. So I'll just say I don't know that it could happen under that public health fund authority yes. in which we're granting to nonprofits. Yep, it would no, likely have to be a separate. Right. Thank yeah, you for process. clarifying that. Yeah. I was looking just for a similar yes. process, and it just yeah. Um, Bev, please. You're Excuse me, when I moved, first moved up here in 1991, I did daycare for 15 years. And back then, the county and public health, they always had a pool of money for daycare providers in the event of emergency or something. Like one time, my stove went out. Oh. And so I was able to get some funding through the county yep. for that. Um, it was like a, I had to match, you know, so much of that. Yep. And and that was really helpful, you yeah. know, because when stuff like that goes out, and of course, your stove is a, a you know vital part of your daycare program for meals, and um, and they also had um, a, an an outstanding um, support group that they um, ran too, you know, for providers, and we started amongst that group. We started a, a toy lending library. We got grant funding. The county helped us get that, and we did a toy lending library where we had these nice big bag kits of toys and whatever. You know, and we exchange them from daycare to daycare. For so over the years, I I see that I don't know if the counties is as involved in things like that right. with daycare providers, and and of course then from what I'm hearing, it because I really push. I love doing daycare. I feel so fortunate to be able to stay have stayed home, and you know watched all these wonderful children grow up in this community, and and for me it was a living. You know, it was a living, and I made good money at it, but oh. I also had 10, 12 kids at the time. But back then, we had variances that you could get. I think the state part licensing stuff mm -hmm. was much easier, mm -hmm. too, back then, and insurances and all that, the requirements. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if some of that doesn't have to do with a lot of, you know, that they families just don't want to get involved in it anymore. Mm. I don't know if they've made it harder, but mm -hmm. so, yeah. That's that's great insight. So, Thank you. But I so appreciate the county and the support that you know us daycare providers had back in the day. So. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner Storley. 
Well, I think the seminar that we all attended mm -hmm. has brought many things to light, and I think we can work with them in the individual areas mm -hmm. and, and maybe with public health, but that was an eye-opener to mm -hmm. attend that seminar and hopefully move forward with all the different suggestions mm -hmm. and not only suggestions but doing it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah that's, I guess that's kind of why I was bringing it up <coughs> is because I, I, we need to act. We, we got to do something. Um, and that's what... That's yeah. The finance side of things seemed um, pretty clear to me, but I know it, it's not fair um, that that it, it falls on the county taxpayers, and so um, to to some extent, it it really disrupts me the wrong way. I feel like it should be coming from the state more um, mm -hmm. because it is a statewide issue, and and I think we need a statewide solution as well. Um, but I, I also know it's not fair to the county ta taxpayers to not meet this demand. Um, and, and if it can't be done with the market, then, uh, then, we, need to, then we need to look at how, how, we can, how we can make it work. So, and Mr. Yoki. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So last week, um, you all, the county board, approved the budget calendar for fiscal year 23. Um, so we're starting that process, and so you're raising this issue now as timely. Um, and I, you know, I understand your trepidation and your feeling of that, you know, really this should be happening at the state or even better the federal level, mm -hmm. but it's not. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, if we are going to entertain that possibility, um, I think we need to start having those conversations here in the, in the coming weeks and months. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would suggest, you know, a future committee, the whole agenda, mm -hmm. maybe as early as next month, we, we put that on. You know, and I think when we do have more conversations, it would really behoove us to involve the early childhood coalition yeah. um, because they're really the, the boots on the ground, um, you know, at this point, um, figuring that out. And, and I would like to include as many providers, you know, in that conversation too because – I guess I'm not entirely clear how many providers are a part of that coalition and how much the coalition is kind of reaching out to them and, and bouncing ideas off of. So, but I don't I don't know what's practical. I bet you the pr providers are busy at uh, ten in the morning, <laughs> but yeah, but we can still we can still do an outreach there. So yes, please, Beth. Um, going back to when I was doing daycare, that's one thing the county also helped us in public health is to get a grant to hire a daycare coordinator. Hmm. And that and because that back then it was the the issue of wages, you know, mm -hmm. for the for the provider and not, you know, meeting, you know, goals of, you know, families. And and that was one thing that the daycare coordinator, you know, worked on and stuff is to help educate, you know, the community on just what, you know, how valuable is a child's life. You know, and back then, you know, we were getting like a dollar and a quarter an hour. You know per child and it was like you know you couldn't make a living on that but mm -hmm. then you know after that kind of went through and all this discussion and it was maybe over a year or two you know that went up to 250 a child and yes it doesn't get affordable but then there was that educating people on the um, daycare assistance I don't is daycare assistance still yeah. around yeah it is, and we still administer child care assistance through our <coughs> PHHS department the income guidelines are not um, reflective of local wage markets. Wages? It's okay. so prohibitively low uh, for families to qualify for that okay. type of assistance, and we don't have the supply in terms of daycare availability to meet the demand okay. uh, for families, regardless of their income status. Okay. And that could be and, another. And another thing you mentioned the 10 o'clock meetings was that was something else that the daycare coordinator back did back then was to start a um, subgroup of daycare providers. So that, you know, if we had to be away from our home, somebody from that was trained from that subgroup hmm. could come in and, you know, and fill in for us. Mm -hmm. And which was so helpful because daycare is a burnout. And, you know, I work six days a week from a lot of times six in the morning till six, seven o'clock at night, you know, because kids were lingering and stuff just to meet the demand of parents' schedule. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just to have a few hours off to, even go to the doctor by myself, you know, was so nice. So you yeah. have a sub come in. So that daycare provider um, role, I back then was very, very helpful. Yeah. And kind of implementing different things that were very supportive 
doing daycare. Yeah. So. Well, and that's an, uh, that that um, that's the support that you're saying that's underutilized um, uh, because the income is not. I think that's another avenue we can explore. Uh, you know, having conversations with the state. And talking about that that income level and how we need a little bit more flexibility there. It needs to be community based, not just um, state. Statewide. State, yeah, because that that could really help, I think, too. So, yeah, I just wanted to get the conversation going, and we're derailing a little bit. I apologize, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but that the public health grant fund triggered that thought. So, back to it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so overall. In the three departments that make up PHHS, we saw a decrease in budgeted expenses and an increase in planned revenue. This resulted in an excess of revenue received over costs. $745,941 will be returned to the fund balance. Is that where we say UFTA? Yeah. <laughs> Well, maybe. Oops. There we go. Okay. So people always hear us talk about the phrase fund balance, and I want to explain a little bit about what it is because it is not a slush fund or a rainy day account. Because county operations rely on property tax levy, the Office of the State Auditor requires us to hold a reserve account that is no less than five months of the budgeted operating costs. Five out of 12 months equals 42%. This requirement allows the county to maintain operations during the first five months of the year before the first half of the property tax collections arrive in May. A healthy fund balance also allows the county to fund unbudgeted expenses that arise after the budget has been set. The county recommended fund balance for PHHS is 40%, the highway department is 60%, and the general fund has a target of 75%. To know how much to keep in reserves, we first look at the PHHS annual budget. So the red bars that you see represent the PHHS annual budget going back to 2016. Here you see blue lines, which represent the recommended amount that we should have in the fund balance to meet our obligations in the first five months of these budget years. So the blue lines you see represent 42% of each of those years' budget. In this graph, the blue line still represents the recommended fund balance, but now you can see what the actual fund balance was that was available in each of these budget years. You'll notice that our reserves were much lower than the benchmark in 2016 and 17. Prior to this, the PHHS fund balance <coughs> was lower than recommended. Then, due to mandated program changes from DHS, we added unbudgeted additional staff to economic assistance in 2016. Looking at 2021, the reserves are significantly higher than the target. This is a result of lower than anticipated out-of-home placement costs and increased revenues from our collections in 2020. This was a large return to fund balance going into the 2021 budget. Our 2022 fund balance is quite healthy and now meets 88% of our current budget. For this year's budget, the 2022 budget, we cut our projected out-of-home placement costs in half, and we gave a potential to use $100,000 of reserves should it be needed. This reduced our levy request from the taxpayers. <clears throat> and with that, I'll take any questions at all. Do you, do you remember when I was like, I don't know about using 100,000. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for steering me well and yeah. Uh, and my, I think there's comfort, room to do it again. Yeah, my <laughs> comfort level at uh, that, I think, has uh, increased significantly. And just knowing the efforts that we are doing uh, to prevent out-of-home placements and to try to, you know, have a healthier, um, a healthier community, um, I think, is really, really paying off. Um, so, yeah. But, yeah, well, I say oofta because now we get to argue about uh, how to, <laughs> how to, how to, uh, you know, level, level this off significantly. Um, maybe not now, now, but. Yeah. 
Well, budgeting is coming, and let's just yep. remember where that three quarters of a million dollars came from. Yep. Yes. Yeah. So, yep. we do have needs. Definitely, we know that, but we also have responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Any other any other um, questions or thoughts or Mr. Yoki? I, I just want to say this presentation once again demonstrates how complicated the well, finances yeah. of the department are. And Lori, you and your team just do such a great job. And yeah. I'm grateful to you. You always have the answers. You always know what's going on. And uh, really grateful for your capable leadership in this area. Thank you. Yeah, you make you, you present it as like so easy almost, but it's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's far from that. Um, I appreciate the detail. Yeah. I know it takes a lot of work to do something like this, and I appreciate that work. Our goal is to make people understand, and if it's not understanding to the taxpayers, then it's it's not it's not good. People need to understand where their money's going. Yeah. Any other thoughts, questions? All right. Well, thank you very much, Lori. Really you. appreciate it, and um, no doubt we'll be talking soon too with with the budget. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> that brings us down to item six, the director's report. Start with echoing the. Thanks to Lori for the time and effort you put into that presentation and to all of the program supervisors and staff as well who contributed to making that a really robust report and telling some of the stories behind mm -hmm. the numbers. Thank you all. Uh, so starting with staff updates, I am sorry to say that we have five vacancies in the department right now, which is a lot for our small team of 30. Uh, we are recruiting and in the process of filling all of these with a few more on deck. Um, I'll review each of those. Uh, the first being the adult services social worker position that has been vacant since December when Beth Benson retired. Uh, we had approved a hire at last month's PHHS board. Um, that candidate since withdrew their application of interest, so we went back to the drawing board, reposted, had two interviews last week and have extended an offer to someone who has accepted and will be starting in that position in early May. Uh, that was just a late afternoon <laughs> occurrence, so we'll oh. put that before the regular board next Tuesday the 26th for your approval. Uh, the mental health worker position, uh, this is um, backfilling uh, the community support worker that we had previously that was reconfigured into children's mental health uh, and uh, mental health worker. Uh, that was a new position for 2022 in our budget. We uh, will be interviewing this week for that position. Uh, the mental health crisis worker position, which is that two-year pilot program funded with ARPA dollars embedding a crisis worker within law enforcement, uh, that is currently posted and we are actively recruiting for that position. Uh, we are in the process of recruiting for an eligibility specialist, backfilling the vacancy created by Agni Smith's resignation. That resignation was acknowledged at the regular board meeting earlier this month. That position was posted last week and closes at the end of this week. Uh, we have an additional vacancy in adult services anticipated with the retirement of Lynn Wright later this summer. Uh, we have, uh, as you acknowledged on our consent agenda today, extended an offer to Jade Waltman to move into that position from Children's Mental Health, which is fantastic in that it retains Jade within our agency, but unfortunate in that it creates another vacancy in our department. So we will be posting for that Children's Mental Health <coughs> case manager this week. Uh, another anticipated position is the SHIP coordinator. So historically we've contracted with the Sawtooth Mountain Clinic to uh, staff that position, which is uh, fully grant funded with state dollars. Uh, right now we are uh, bringing a job description before personnel committee this afternoon to review uh, for a part-time public health educator, which will be working under that SHIP grant. 
um, our staff are working on budget revisions to the state to be able to bill our current staff time to ship as Andrea Orest <coughs> will be providing some temporary support to maintain ship programming during the transition. Uh, May is a very busy month, unfortunately, for the SHIP program with all of the in-school bike education, walk to school day, mm -hmm. the bike rodeo, uh, so anticipating some extra hours in that department this month as uh, it's more than um, we can absorb those 20 hours a week. It's just not feasible to um, have that come under our two public health educators given the level of response work that they're continuing to provide. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you, you heard this morning about the dynamic response that's still required of our team with changes in booster eligibility and the need to set up vaccination uh, very <coughs> quickly to be responsive to those changing federal guidelines. We are still relying on 15 hours a week of temporary support as well from our temporary public health educator, uh, Abby Benusa, is in that role and has been providing case investigation, contact tracing support. Uh, so we are anticipating the need to absorb those 15 hours within our public health team at the end of May when her contract expires. Uh, we are anticipating no levy impact with tra transitioning that part-time ship position from a subcontract to an internal position. Uh, and additionally, we're planning to have our public health team back here uh, in June to provide a presentation on uh, what some of the visions are for transitioning from direct response into recovery mode. Uh, we're doing some strategic planning at a regional level with our nurse consultant at the Minnesota Department of Health. And it'll be a good opportunity to bring the full team before the board and, and share a bit on some of the programming and grants and opportunities that that team will be working under into the future. Uh, we're also developing a job description for a behavioral health team supervisor. You'll get to hear quite a bit more of that later this morning from me at the Committee of the Whole presentation. Um, I already talked about Jade's vacancy. We'll be posting for Children's Mental Health Case Manager and then as well for the Executive Administrative Assistant position that will be vacated with Sarah's uh, move on from the department as well. So it's a really an unprecedented level of yeah. turnout for our, or turnout, turnover for our department. Um, you know, this isn't exit interview official, but I wanted to just give some anecdotal information from what we're hearing from staff about their reasons for deciding to leave the organization. Yes, please. Um, especially we're seeing some really, you know, high, high performing staff leave, which is, which is a challenge. Staff have been with us for a number of years. Um, what we're finding is that people are really able to find better paying jobs in the field of health and human services with greater opportunity for career advancement. Um, some of these positions they're able to find working fully remote and without the stress of direct client interaction that are required for a lot of our positions. Uh, we're no longer competing with local employers for jobs. We're competing with state and federal employers with the renewed availability of remote work. It's a double-edged sword. Um, really, what what Broadbent has done is we saw all these opportunities of people being able to ro work work from home, and now we're seeing also the the competition of the jobs. So. Yeah, it's really a new era as it relates to both recruiting and retaining our staff. Yeah. It's something we're paying attention to certainly and looking at how we can really enhance those things within the department that aren't as tangible, but make it a great place to work. Mm -hmm. Especially coming out of, you know, a two year traumatic event during the pandemic when, you know, our staff are not only providing services to people in highly stressed situations, but navigating their own stressful life events. Births of children and grandchildren, lack of housing and childcare. All of these impact our staff as much as they do the people we serve. So a note of gratitude for all of my coworkers in PHHS, whether you're on your way out the door or actively looking for work or not planning on staying, just so grateful for everyone, all the contributions they've made over the last two years and beyond. And thank you, Allison, for, for 
for your work and, and navigating all of all of the transitions too. And I I don't doubt that you also feel stress in your life. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for Allison? Staffing updates. <coughs> <clears throat> Mr. Chair, um, I would just like to mention, for, first of all, Allison, I, I hear you, and I know this is an issue, and I, I know that um, being competitive in terms of compensation is super important. We are starting the compensation study. Um, that's going to take a look at our pay structure to make sure that, um, that we are competitive. And no, no foregone conclusions here yet, but I kind of have an idea where that's going to go. Um, and so, you know, the, the other things in, in terms of being competitive, I think there are things that we can do from, from a non-monetary standpoint that are really important. And one of those is just creating a culture where people feel supported, where people want to be. Um, <clears throat> and, and I'm not saying, well, we can do that in lieu of paying higher wages. Um, that's not the case, but I think we need both. Um, so, so I hear you loud and clear. I, you know, we, <laughs> we thought we were kind of getting ahead of things here a little bit in terms of recruitment. We, we had, I think, four vacancies several months ago, and we kind of whittled away at that, and now we're back to five vacancies. And uh, again, this is not unique to Cook County. This is something that employers across the country are seeing, that the workforce is more mobile than it's ever been before, and we are competing with you know, companies and organizations well outside of Cook County. Um, so there's there's a lot of work to be done there yet. Um, but I feel like we're in a good position to get, get that into focus and uh, hopefully become more competitive and, and improve on retaining employees. Yeah, on, on that note, some other things I think too is just the flexibility, mm -hmm. uh, providing flexibility for our staff mm -hmm. um, and um, um, and I know you're exploring options there too, as far as scheduling is concerned, and that's something that I've been hearing from staff is, mm -hmm. and, uh, is that flexibility. And, and I, I think that you know, as long as the work is getting done, and um, I think it's super important to accommodate staff however they need. Mm -hmm. um, I want to be supportive of them in that way specifically as well. So, mm -hmm. thank you for your awareness of, of the situation and, and yours as well, Allison. In your efforts to address it. Any other thoughts, questions? Else we can move on to the agency updates. Okay, and I'll be brief because you're going to get to hear me talk later today. <laughs> Some good news from the state level are we received late last week a report from the Human Services Performance Management System, which is the DHS agency or division that's tasked with ensuring. Um, that counties are meeting performance standards in key areas. One of the areas that we're measured in is with our uh, application timeliness processing for SNAP, the Nutrition Assistance Program, and Cash Assistance. So Cook County yet again exceeded all performance standards for 2021. 98% uh, of SNAP and cash applications were processed within 30 days. And for those who need immediate support, and that criteria is defined by the state, uh, based on a household's available resources and income and their anticipated expenses. In that area, Cook County processed and issued SNAP assistance to 86% of households within one business day. Uh, so we've, we really outpaced our state and regional peers by a significant margin in that area. So kudos to our economic assistance team for continuing that great work. Another big change at a federal level, or not a change rather, <laughs> is that the federal public health emergency was again extended for 90 days. So where this most directly impacts our work as a department is with the policies and procedures in place to maintain eligibility for Minnesota health care programs. So those will be extended for another 90 days. That was effective April 16th. And DHS is in partnership with counties starting to do some pre-planning around the eventual uh, rollback of those program waivers. Um, I was at a meeting on Friday with some of our, our DHS leadership, and they shared that statewide there are 1.4 million renewals that will need to be processed retroactively. 
um, throughout the public health emergency, the coverage has been waived so that people can maintain that health care eligibility during that time. DHS is anticipating up to a year to complete the backlog of renewals and is saying this is the largest volume of work ever for Minnesota health care programs. So something we're certainly gearing up for within our team, especially acknowledging that we're, we're down uh, one position. We have a new staff person on. <coughs> want to thank and recognize Allison Plummer, who is our supervisor of that team, is going through the process of learning long-term care eligibility so that she can maintain continuity for those applicants and enrollees during the transitions. <coughs> The last thing I'll share is that uh, last week on Monday in St. Paul, I attended my first in-person meeting in two years <laughs> with uh, state, tribal, and county leadership, which was very exciting and was really nice to step back into that space of being in, in presence with people again for a really long time. I uh, really realized what I've been missing over the last two years on Zoom. I have managed to stay uh, engaged with Maxa, but it's just not the same as it is being in person and really prioritize this as my first entry back into those in-person meetings as it's that tribal, county, and state uh, leadership forum meeting. Um, I've been participating through Zoom in this work group for the last two years. Um, so our meeting on Monday, uh, it was really a lot of visioning work on how we can work collectively to improve human services systems for uh, people across the state and really work on improving outcomes and reducing disparities in tribal communities in particular. Thank you. Yeah. Any, uh, any questions for Allison? <coughs> the agency updates? Okay. Thank you, Allison. That moves us down to items for action for board action. There are none. And then that moves us down to our committee reports, which we've missed the last two. Um, so I'm sure there are more updates than we can provide, but uh, let's, 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 let's go for it. And, uh, and we are, you know, pressed for time somewhat again, but, um, but we'll do our darndest here. So item A is the Active Living Steering Committee, Commissioner Swalson. We did have our uh, <coughs> meeting on April 5th. Allison gave a good update on, because of the changes, of course, it was appropriate to have it in a report uh, bringing the <coughs> SHIP coordinator now back into uh, public health and human services. Um, that was a big part of our discussion. Beyond that, I would just add, uh, to keep it short, we are still, the, the bike rodeo will occur on May 12th in the community center parking lot there is a sign up online for volunteers and we still need you. So please, you know, actively participate when you can. That's it. Is there a snow plan? <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, good, <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I, B is AEOA um, and we have a meeting on Wednesday. I guess the long and short of the report I would give and Bev, please feel free to, to add anything on is there, there's a, uh, significant challenges both with staffing and with supplies <coughs> uh, there's been buses on much like our trucks here at the county there's been buses on order and they're having a, a heck of a time and and the staffing I would say is widespread whether it's um, um, head start or, um, or or the housing uh, work um, pretty much you name it they, they need they need help so um, and some significant transitions there too um, but but the work continues and it's and it's amazing work. I don't I don't know that I have anything specific I want to say there. Do you have anything? Beth? No, no. no. Yeah. Um, and then we'll move on to item C is AHA. Um, there is a sold out concert. Uh, Cloud Cult will be performing down at the North Shore Theater, and that's a fundraiser and kind of an awareness, uh, uh, um, just raising awareness for mental health and mental health support. Um, and still not sure um, what's going to happen with the Moose Lake um, fund and the, and the new formula. So we're still kind of at, at, at the edge of our seat with that. Um, but real good advocacy and, and DHS is hearing us and, and, and recognizes the concerns. And, um, you know, I heard that at AMC as well. So, so there's hope. Um, ARC, Commissioner Hawkins. Um, let's see, I had a meeting on Friday. 
good news and bad news coming out of St. Paul. <laughs> good news, um, there's still increased funding for community corrections in one of the bills. Bad news, there's also another bill out there that wants to um, eliminate disciplinary, disciplinary room time and that would affect AJC and they are very concerned because if they cannot remove an individual hmm. and put them into a room at certain times mm -hmm. for behavior issues, they are afraid they're going to lose more staff. There were four that just retired. There's, there's an issue here. Yeah. It, there's stress levels. Yeah. And um, so if you have any reaching out to <laughs> our um, representatives, one good bill, one be one bill that maybe a line needs to be changed, and ah. they're working on that. So that was the report on from them on Friday. Thank you. Um, item E, Community Health Board. Uh, big news there is um, uh, Community Health Board applied for and received uh, um, basically infrastructure, community health infrastructure. Um, grant and it's uh, a, a trial for two years. Um, I believe the original one was for four hundred and eighty-seven thousand. I want to say um, so that's significant, and that would be for the region for kind of this pilot of adding um, uh, uh, specialists, basically, and trying to revision what public health in Minnesota will look like. Um, one thing that was tacked onto that though, which is really great, but also much bigger, is that they, uh, the state asked for the plan to incorporate evaluation and an evaluation plan, and they added an additional 400,000 to the grant for that aspect of it. Um, and evaluation is very important, um, getting ahead of that and having that plan, yeah. yeah. Um, but it just really elevated the game, I'd say, with that. And uh, so, and that was a very fast turnaround. I want to say it was like three weeks or something really? between the application. Yeah, so, so it was just like, ready, set, go. And, and now it's, again, ready, set, go, now that we yeah. know we've got it. So very exciting. Um, and and um, uh, just having the, the regional public health leaders come together and, and talk about what can be done, what's working, what, what changes. And a lot of it comes down to communication. So there's a real emphasis on, on public health communicating and, and that structure. Um, so, so that's huge there. Um, and maybe I'll leave it, leave it there. Um, item F is the, the local advisory f um, for the local mental health advisory um, council and Rana. Yes. Um, we have actually added a subcommittee, which has been meeting twice a month be in response to a committee member's desire for more detailed information about certain issues and what we're doing and what things mean. And Allison and Sarah have been attending that too. And I really appreciate their extra effort to help, help the committee members understand more about what needs to be done, what the possibilities are. And also, Allison had, I don't know if you've seen this, but this is a list of services that we have provided and what we need to provide. And it's just, ref, I think, indicates the amount of work that goes into all of this and how helpful it is for us as community members. And there's even a member of our group now who works in Duluth and just comes because it makes them feel good to hear what we're doing, which I think is really says a lot about our group. As far as specific issues, I don't. I think we've probably already talked about most of them here. I don't, uh, I don't have any other major things. I think it's everything is. I'm just so impressed at how how much work goes into things and how effective it really is, and how people are getting help. And if if there's a need, it's brought up and it's dealt with and it's provided. So I think that's great. Good. I thought I was going to go longer. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's all right. Let's Restorative see. justice, I think. Yes, right. okay. Um, last month, there was a part-time um, <coughs> case coordinator, coordinator hired, um, and I have a meeting again in a couple days, so I'll be anxious to find out how that's working. And yeah. The last report, there were, there were two active cases. That's all I have to report. 
And Commissioner Hawkins, I apologize. I once again this month neglected to include the summary report that we received from Restorative Justice on the agenda. So next month I'll make sure to get caught up with those so that the board can see. It made me wonder summaries. if I was supposed to give you a reminder or if I was no, supposed to send that's that on. on so. me. I <laughs> okay. All right. Apologize. I'm willing to do whatever I need to <laughs> make sure. <laughs> Thank you. Apologies there. We're on to item H, um, Council on Aging. Correct. Um, so we have had a number of meetings and subcommittees working with Cook County Council on Aging. Um, they're in the process of looking at uh, their financial committee, looking at things and getting ready for that public health community grant process that Allison referred to earlier and um, getting all their ducks in a row because they are a 501c3 and will hope to participate for the upcoming year. Um, they have also recently actually are finalizing a a grant with uh, Arrowhead Operation Roundup and are working on upgrading a number of safety um, components in their facility and they've been uh, working in cooperation here with Mike Keyport because the hub happens to be a place where we could uh, have some emergency management operations. Um, I can't imagine what kinds of emergencies we might have here mm. in Cook County. But uh, anyway, we're doing some upgrading so that even outside of hours during the evening and on weekends, that facility is available and ready for our entire public to use. So um, that's our update. On to item nine, typo there, uh, Emergency Preparedness Committee. Um, I'm not the primary. Um, we have Commissioner Sullivan and Commissioner Swallison. It's all right, well, we were both there. Mm -hmm. Anything you would like to share? No, mostly we just had discussions on uh, the conditions, COVID and... And fires. <laughs> and fire, and the, yeah, the discussion, as always, everybody looks at the amount of snow that we have on the ground and continuing to come down and thinks that, wow, we're in great shape for this next year, but our Forest Service folks reminded us the ground is still frozen. It will help with lake levels around the area, but not the moisture that is uh, needed in the ground. We, we need to get the frost out of the ground so we can absorb some. <laughs> and we talked all, all about the trees coming down in the treetops and yep. the kind of litter that that adds, the fuel that it adds to our county. Um, so we're not out of the woods yet. Hmm. <laughs> Unintended. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, item J, Healthcare Planning Committee. Uh, Commissioner Sterling? We did not meet. Okay. And then we have uh, Kay as NACO. Any, anything okay, to Okay, well, yeah. um, going back to February. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I had to review my notes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so NACO is a coalition of over 3,000 counties, just for your background here. And um, I represent the county and the state. We have a large delegation that up until 21 were in person. Now we're remote, and that was fine. Um, they did dedicate one day for the health committee meeting. And I'll just um, preface it by saying all of the resolutions that we discussed, which was over 15 to 20, had to do with mental health. Mm -hmm. So it affected um, family, child care, prison inmates. But the interesting resolution that we did pass was the United States is the highest in birth deaths. Mm -hmm. I did not know that mm -hmm. among minorities so forth. Mm -hmm. So we passed a very emphasized resolution that there be more money for education for uh, people in the rural areas to be able to get to a doctor and so forth. So that, that stunned us all. We were, there was silence there when that mm -hmm. came up. Um, I guess the other thing I would say is that um, I continue to um, join when I can monthly because we have monthly meetings and um, report on that when I can in the future. Thank you, Commissioner Sterling. Um, Northeast Office of Job Training. Um, we have met. I don't think I have <coughs> anything to report there. Um, there are some changes. Um, uh, there was a program dropped because it wasn't getting used and um, and it is covered by another program. I don't have the specifics at the top of mind, but there's not, I don't think there's anything really significant to, to drop there. But I mostly get out of those meetings is kind of the regional updates, what's <coughs> happening economically um, in, in, the, in the state. And it's funny be because I just, I think I've expressed this before. Um, 
you can kind of see what's coming and then in other counties it maybe isn't there quite yet and so then you hear about it later and we'll, yeah as far as worker shortage or, or housing and, and that kind of thing so it's interesting but same old same old uh, North Shore Collaborative did not um, meet I don't think since since last meeting but we'll, we will be meeting um, and I guess need to put a, a word out to uh, encourage any of our community partners who are looking for grant funding to apply because that's always um, a really powerful avenue for for our regional partners is to to get money through this um, this grant agency so um, and then the Public Health and Human Services Advisory Council and that would be that would be Bev now do you have anything you want to share from that um, we met on March 1st and um, Pat had been filling in for me as the chair um, and and so that was my first meeting back. I sat on that board many, many years ago. Um, one thing that came out of it, um, as always, the COVID updates, and Grace then shared the tool on the County Hub's website um, so that we're checking down at our hub but the, um, for the, with the Council on Aging um, was that tool. And so I, and I hope other businesses are using that because I think it's a really great, great tool and guideline that they've, they've started to use. Um, so I go on, look on Thursdays or Fridays, what level are we at, you know, as far as mask wearing. And, I, and it, it, the discussion I've heard down at the hub has been less confusion. You know, and people are grateful and then come in and then, you know, you say, well, if you, you know, come in and it's medium, you know, recommend it if it's high, you know, you need to. So it's just cleared up a lot of things. Um, so that that was outstanding. So, and that was, and then uh, we're going to get in the pro we're going to be in the process of starting the uh, five year uh, community health improvement plan. So yep. we work starting to work on that. So that's always exciting. Yeah, it's, it'll be. I think I cut the tail end of it before, yep. and so this is my first, and so I'm really excited yep. because so much of our work and and vantage is is from from that plan. Yep. So. Yep. All right, for the good of the order. Allison, please. I have an you. answer. Sorry, Commissioner. Uh, answer to a question. So I'll save a follow up email from uh, Lori. The number of uh, individuals on our uh, waiting list for in home support services is currently eight. eight. Oh, okay. okay. And Commissioner Storley. Yes, well, we've been sitting here talking about the health of our community and everybody, and this is Earth Week and the health of Earth. And Friday at 4.30 at the community center is a great amount of activities planned and looking forward to uh, seeing all kinds of good things to remind us about taking care of our earth too. Thank you. Anybody else for the good of the order? Anything else? Otherwise we have up upcoming meetings, events, and trainings um, listed there. April 19th, Violence Prevention Center Community Vigil of Hope Honoring Survivors of Sexual Assault. And the second one is April 19th, presentation on suicide prevention with James Zimmer, Cook County, Cook County Higher Ed. Um, and uh, the next one is April 26th, training for direct service professionals on mental illness and crisis communication strategies. And that's hosted by the Violence Prevention Center. I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll make that motion. Thank you, Commissioner Swallison. Is there support? Support. Thank you, Commissioner mm -hmm. Sullivan. We are adjourned. <laughs> That's right. <laughs>